A couple of years ago, the uh, Cedar uh, Steering Committee and all of you decided that we should have an annual Cedar Prize lecturer to uh, recognize uh, transitional ground basing, uh, ground, ba uh, yeah, sorry, ground breaking. I'm a ground based aeronomer, so I said it. Okay, ground, ground breaking research that really leads us forward in our field. We've had some really wonderful speakers. Today's speaker is Larissa Goncharenko from MIT Haystack Observatory. And since I'm chairing this session and am a good friend of, of uh, Larissa, I get to introduce L Larissa to you. She did her university and graduate education at the Kharkov Polytechnical University in Kharkov, Ukraine. She worked for the Institute of the Ionosphere there, uh, doing incoherent scatter radar and upper atmospheric heating experiments. In 1990, a number of us had the good fortune to go to Suzdal, a ways uh, east of Moscow, to a, to a conference. And uh, while there, a presentation was given by the young Larissa Goncharenko. And uh, I got to meet her because she was doing radar work and had a very, very good command, an excellent command of the, of the English language. And we were very interested in the interactions of the incoherent scatter radars in what was then that year, the former Soviet Union and the US and in, and in Europe. And so we had a very interesting collaboration over a number of years. In 1996, um, Larissa came to the US and began working with us at MIT Haystack Observatory and immediately got into thermospheric studies and became an active participant in the CEDAR program. She worked with the TIME program and did quite a bit of uh, overall community coordination. And so she's well known by many, many of you. She's just completed two years, two terms as the AGU secretary for, for aeronomy and has done a real good service for, for all of us. Since 2006, Larissa has been a strong proponent of studies of stratospheric sudden warmings. And she's organized and led CEDAR and research community campaigns every year studying this subject since 2007. For the last two years, she's been the organizer and the leader of an ISI international research collaboration on atmospheric coupling during these stratospheric warming events. The sudden stratospheric warming research topic is really significant. It's transitional groundbreaking science, but to me, it's something else. It is scientific research that actually addresses and crosses the barrier between the lower and the upper atmosphere. It's a barrier that many of us have run into in our, in our programs. The CEDAR strategic plan wants to look at geospace, the coupling of all of these regions, and this very successful research program is groundbreaking in getting really active participation from the lower atmospheric scientists and us, the CEDAR research community internationally. Larissa is truly an expert on stratospheric sudden warmings and their effects in the ionosphere. This is a topic of her presentation today. Larissa, thank you for all the good work in the area, and we're really excited that you're our prize lecturer this year. Thank you, John. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to uh, talk, uh, talk about these results, and I, um, and I hope uh, that um, I, I've been working on this for several years, and um, after some of my presentations, I, uh, people would come to me and say, you know, I don't really see what you see. I, I don't understand how you see this. And my response was, well, I did present it. How, how, I don't see it how, how you don't see it. So I hope that after this, maybe at least some of you will be able to see what I see. Um, mm. Uh, I will start with uh, motivation for all this research is really large, unexplained variability in the ionosphere. Uh, we study ionosphere for decades. There are still many, many questions but that we, uh, we, we don't understand. And uh, part of the problem is um, so-called forcing of meteorological origin that we know that on average it can be 20, 30 percent. There are cases where our example is much, much stronger. And, um, 
some earlier results, uh, some earlier studies sh showed uh, that it's comparable to geomagnetic activity. Spent a lot of, a lot of effort on understanding forcing from above, forcing due to geomagnetic storms. And um, uh, I was thinking how to approach, uh, what is the best way actually to approach studies of coupling between low and upper atmosphere. And um, uh, this, this slide shows actually a timeline of how, how this whole thing developed. John said that I'm expert on strat warmings. Uh, not quite. Uh, back in 2006, I went with a seminar to MIT, talked to our MIT colleagues, talked about our biomesseric research, our, our problems. And um, in discussions with Professor Alan Plum, I said that I am looking for something. I, I want to study connection with lower atmosphere, and I'm just looking for some sort of event. Do you have something really, really big? We study large magnetic storms in, uh, as, for, as an example of forcing for, from above. Um, what do you have in the low atmosphere? What is really big? And his immediate response was, well, why? It's sun and stratospheric warmings. So at this point, uh, this, this was 2006, was the first time when I ever heard about it. And at this point, I decided, uh, of course, light bulb went off, and I said, okay, very simple thing. What do we see when such things occur? Uh, after, very, uh, 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 after very brief search, uh, it turned out that we really do not have any ionospheric data during such event. Uh, such events. And the first step was to organize um, uh, incoherent scatter radio campaign through our uh, World Day program. Uh, we had, we had the, such campaigns organized since 2007. We had our first successful um, World Day campaign in January 2008. And uh, four years ago, in this room at the CEDA meeting, we presented, we had our first workshop on atmospheric responses to strat moments. At that workshop, we reported results from all the readers, Poca Flat, Arecibo, Hikamaka, Milston Hill, and uh, they were all different. We couldn't really understand them. And, uh, but uh, all we only consensus was some, something is happening, something strong is happening. And all of this was received with really a lot of um, uh, caution from the community. So uh, we, we kept, kept continuing these experiments for every winter. What really helped was um, record strong stratospheric moment event in 2009 with uh, very low solar activity and extremely strong strat warming event. Really helped to uh, understand signatures of strat warming. Um, and for the, uh, for the first three years, the community um, accepted or li listened to these results and accepted with a lot of caution, which is understandable. Uh, papers were rejected, proposals were declined, and after the meetings, uh, people would uh, come and tell, uh, you shouldn't be presented with a professional meeting. This simply cannot happen. It cannot be true. Uh, not, it, not, not just for me, for, for other people who worked uh, on, on this phenomenon, worked in this field, when people would come and tell me that uh, some of the responses at, uh, for, to, to my papers were that uh, the interesting results your paper can be published only if you remove everything but you talk about what you can connection to strat warming. Only at that point your paper can be published. So uh, this lasted for several years, um, and of course we kept uh, uh, organizing meetings, kept presenting more results. Um, what is happening now? Only uh, three years from 2008 to 2011, in the end of 2011, Dr. Wang had a nice, uh, nice study with WAM models, nice study with strat warming, and I really like this situation when he says that these new results have triggered an explosion of studies or mechanisms and types of possible connections between terrestrial and space weather during strat warmings and other large-scale perturbations. Papers that were uh, declined uh, earlier on now cited up to 45 times. So we're talking about all this change in a matter of three years. And of course, we are really, really, really early in the understanding what, what's, what's happening in this process. Uh, so my lecture is about uh, several, uh, there are several particular parts about this lecture. I will be talking about strat warming as meteorological event. Uh, I will give some examples of known ionospheric responses, what we were able to associate with strat warmings. Uh, of course, we we'll need to spend some time talking about how we can interpret it. What are suggested mechanisms? How, how this actually happens? 
And hopefully we will have some time um, what to expect in the future. To begin with, sudden stratospheric warming is really enormous event of enormous strength. If we look at uh, uh, variation in temperature uh, for the whole year, black line is 30-year mean, red line is variation during 2009, and we are looking at temperature at North Pole, 90 degrees north, 10 hectopascal, 32 kilometers in altitude, North Pole. Uh, we see that. Uh, in winter time, uh, after initial period of really cold stratosphere, within a matter of three days, temperature goes from coldest temperature of the winter to highest temperature, much higher than average temperature in summer. Enormous change in, uh, in, in the system during this particular time. It is accompanied by extremely large variation in the in stratospheric dynamics when uh, zonal wind go from uh, all the way from strongly eastward to strongly westward, do not recover for a significant time. And you can see again, the whole perturbation from uh, strongest winter condition to strongest summer condition. And all happens in a matter of three days. This is one example, uh, and we look, we look how this phenomenon develops in time. How does it look in space? Uh, this is a wintertime polar stratospheric phenomena. So if center is the North Pole, um, and before stratospheric warming, we have very cold uh, polar vortex, approximately symmetric around the pole. During the strat warming, uh, uh, we have a rapid, a large increase in temperature uh, with certain expand in latitude and longitude, often really asymmetric, and, some, uh, and it is accompanied, this increase is accompanied also by some, some cells of cooling. Uh, so this is... Uh, uh, Dramatic coupling event that happens in the winter and in the polar atmosphere. Uh, it is interpreted currently, most accepted interpretation, that it results from interaction of planetary waves with zonal mean flow. Important thing to remember that planetary waves, what we're talking about, are quasi-stationary planetary waves, and just prior to strat warmings, they reach extremely high amplitudes. So this is the largest planetary wave that occurs in nature. And, uh, a number of studies showed how uh, this, um, these events are accompanied by extremely large change in temperature, wind, gravity wave activity, and so on. I was thinking how I can summarize quickly uh, what I've learned after these years about sudden stratospheric warming. And uh, this is a quick summary. They are not really sudden. They are not really stratospheric. And by any means, they are not warmings. <laughs> uh, point here that uh, this is event that we use arbitrary terminology to define this event. But when we talk about this, we need to think not only about this terminology, we need to th think about all the underlying physics, which is extremely complex. And I will show some examples of this. About the first point, uh, the stratosphere, sudden stratospheric moments are not really sudden. If we take the same case of January 2009, record strong event, and uh, so this is event, uh, event increase in temperature, uh, so this is peak of the warming. Just prior to the peak of the warming, we had actually record cold polar vortex, which continued for a really long time. We had extremely uh, uh, cold uh, vortex for a long time after the event. Uh, prior, prior to stratospheric warming event, we have a very strong eastward zonal wind. And look at the time frame. We're talking about very, very extended time. Um, we know that uh, stratospheric moments are associated with extremely high planetary wave activity. And planetary wave activity is, uh, here's point three, is very large prior to the peak of strat warming. But what happens after strat warming develops that we have extremely low planetary activity. There is a so-called collapse of planetary wave activity, and it lasts for a very long time. You see, he, here we have, uh, this graph shows until the end of March. Planetary wave activity pretty much never recovered to average level. So uh, by any case, these events are not sudden. There is a lot of preconditioning, and there is a, lo there is a lot happening after that. Okay, uh, this is just one case, and record event, uh, by no means uh, we can make really strong conclusions about this. Um, Limpas-1 made uh, 
a study of a composite study of, I think, 39 <coughs> stratwarming events. And <coughs> he determined, he, he separated stratwarming in several stages. He decided stages as onset, growth, maturity, decline, and decay, each one of them two, 15 days long. And there are, there are many, uh, many features that we saw in, in the case event of 2009. There is cold, uh, colder temperature in the polar just before. So before it gets hot, it actually it is really cold. Uh, <coughs> development, uh, there is strong, uh, very strong, zone, abnormally strong zonal flow in high latitude. What, what is not shown in this uh, figure, abnormally weak uh, zonal flow at lower at equatorial latitudes. So polar waters is actually restricted. Um, during growth and mature stage, these anomalies mm, progress downward, descend to the lower stratosphere. Uh, winds and uh, temperature peak in the mature stage, which is uh, mature stage here, um, day zero plus minus seven days. And, um, and during the mature stage, we have, uh, we have already declined in the planetary reactivity, planetary reactivity anomalously low for a long time. So the point here is mature stage of stratomy, two weeks. But there are very significant anomalies within plus or minus 40 days. So when we, when we compare um, uh, what is happening, we actually need to consider, uh, uh, consider the whole system in the context of these changes. So we're not uh, uh, comparing uh, what happens in the ionosphere during this anomaly, mature stage, to something which is very different anomaly maybe two weeks before or two weeks later. OK. Uh, now, the point about that it's not really only stratospheric warming events. Stratomians were discovered 60 years ago, actually exactly 60 years ago, in 1952. And for a long time, uh, they, uh, people, people study, actively study these, these events, and people who worked in, in the stratosphere. And uh, studied in, studying in the 1970s, um, very strong effects were discovered in the mesosphere. These effects include uh, one of the, some, some of the most, most well-known, most famous. If we have uh, here warming in the polar stratosphere, we have cooling in the polar mesosphere. Cooling is uh, well-known, still not, not that well understood, but well-known and studied effect. We have change in gravity waves. We have variation all the way in the mes mesosphere in the zonal mean flow. Uh, this, this, is, uh, this figure shows variations at high latitudes. Um, there are also a series of very complex variations at middle latitudes, very complex variations at low latitudes. Uh, different groups of people pursued. There is a very strong group in India uh, with re really active working on the, these types of research. And this recent example from, um, shows actually uh, results from Fort Collins slider just published by uh, Tao, Yuan, Tao Yuan. And uh, what Fort Collins LIDAR says, uh, cooling, so it's a uh, mi middle latitude location, middle latitude LIDAR, go, shows cooling in the um, mid latitude mesosphere. And when we, when we look at it, that cooling actually develops, uh, paper shows that cooling develops when uh, just stratospheric disturbance, when, when LIDAR samples region, when um, during uh, 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 when disturbed polar vortex reach, reaches that particular location. And this is another example of how long it takes um, to publish these studies. And another indication, I think first uh, time Tao presented these results, I think three years ago, if Tao is here uh, at, the, at one of the workshops, but it was three years ago, right? This is 2009 strat warming, two years ago. Okay. and. Um, and I know that he, he was trying to publish all these years, he was trying to publish these results. It took a lot of pain to publish. After this published, this is highlight of JGR, JGR journal. Um, so we have a lot of interesting effects in the, uh, in the mesosphere, and I won't be talking a lot. This meso mesospheric events are very active area research. No, not much is understood, uh, very complex. Another... Um, uh, Another vertical coupling that uh, it's not only uh, stratospheric warming couple altitude regions not only to higher altitudes, but they also provide downward forcing to the troposphere. Uh, this figure shows um, uh, studies of extreme events, uh, weak polar vortex, uh, 
And so they define this weak polar vortex and uh, strong polar vortex. And they show, and, uh, I think they look at 39 different events. And they show how anomalies in stratospheric dynamics slowly descend to the troposphere. And you look at this, at this time frame, uh, and um, what happens is that it, it takes two weeks and longer to descend to the troposphere. And uh, variations in, in the troposphere include large variations in tropospheric dynamic in cyclones, and uh, it changes location of storm tracks, and it changes actually the life, likelihood of mid-latitude storms. Uh, and this is very interesting, in, very interesting area of research, very active right now. I was told 200 people are working now on it. I'm not sure if it's 200 people or 200 publications, but uh, it, it, is, uh, it, it is very active area. And um, we can understand why. Uh, this is an example of where the event, which will, has been associated with 2009 southern stratospheric warming, extremely, so change in winter storms, it, increased probability in winter storms and change of tracks of the storms, brings us really cold temperatures. Uh, after the strict warming of 2009, there was a bitter cold over much of the United States, the temperature below 22 degrees in Fahrenheit, eight inches of snow in London, of course in Massachusetts we just laugh at this and get our, our snow blows out, over there, uh, because it was really unexpected, it was record snowfall for almost 20 years, they stopped all the transportation. Uh, back in, in that paper, Duncanson, uh, 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 they, they showed when, when they looked at progression of these, uh, of these events to the troposphere and they said that, look, if we can understand this, if this is a framework for long-term weather forecast. If we understand the physics, if this is a cornerstone, how to develop long-term forecast and address really critical need of society uh, to, uh, to, to be prepared to mitigate this type of events. Uh, so, uh, my point here is that uh, atmospheric scientists use these extreme events uh, to, uh, to approach, uh, to find solutions to problems that they, they could not even understand how to approach solution, uh, solution before. So, this, is, uh, this was an uh, explanation about some uh, 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 illustration of the topic that it's not only stratospheric phenomena. And, uh, a little bit more illustration that strat warmings are not really only warmings. We were already talking about that strat warmings accompanied by cooling in the mesosphere, by cooling uh, even uh, in, in the troposphere, by, by really cold winters. Uh, they also come, also we can see cooling in the tropical stratosphere, but even in the stratosphere, even in the um, polar stratosphere, we can compare different events. If cold polar vortex before strat warming, when it's disturbed, we have um, we have really cold cell and warm cell. So it's not only warming, it is warming and cooling. And depending on ki kind of event, in a vortex displacement event, there are two cells about the same size. In a vortex split event, we can have two warm cells and two cold cells, and they rapidly change in latitude and longitude. So the idea is that it's not, we should not really think only about warming. We should think about very complex processes that happen during this event. And to and, uh, event is inherently asymmetric, so we need to think about it, uh, how, what we see with particular ground-based instruments would really depend on how, we, where we probe it in location with regard to the disturbed <coughs> polar vortex. Okay, uh, what do we see in the ionosphere? What kind of results were we able to uh, obtain by now? Uh, first, uh, first result, what we, when we reported back in 2008, was uh, what I like to say temperature sandwich in the ionosphere. We were already talking that uh, if we have uh, stratospheric warming in the polar stratosphere, we have stratospheric warming, we have mesospheric cooling. What these results show that we have secondary warming in the lower thermosphere over here, between 120 and 140 kilometers, and secondary cooling. So we, have, we continue the sandwich, warming, cooling, warming, cooling. And it was the uh, first time when uh, these results were shown experimentally and first, first evidence actually that these alternating regions of warming and cooling extend all the way to th at least 300 kilometers. And if we compare uh, experimental results with uh, model predictions by time GCM, we can see this, uh, this behavior. Here is polar stratospheric warming, here is the cooling, secondary warming, 
in the lower thermosphere. So these are all, all things that we see, but we see uh, upper thermospheric cooling in addition to it. And uh, again, important point that we see that mid latitude, where a uh, model really expects that all this phenomena is restricted to high latitudes. Um, is there other evidence that anything happens with temperature in the ionosphere? In fact, there is some evidence, though it is somewhat limited. Mm. We have evidence of strong uh, uh, temperature disturbances from MIPAS uh, data on MVSAT, in European, European satellite, European instrument. Uh, this, is, uh, this is example at high, for high latitude location and example how variations change in longitude and time. So this is our stratospheric warming, warming and, warming and cooling, warm and cold cells. This is mesos mesospheric cooling, and again, stronger thermospheric warming and cooling. And again, it has wave one pattern, so will you see warming or cooling really depends on uh, where your sample, it, was, it, 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 does, it does change with longitude. And one of the points to, uh, to note here that these effects are strong in the stratosphere, quite a bit weaker in the mesosphere, and again, strong again in the upper thermosphere. Uh, in addition to this, uh, to this, uh, uh, to this paper, there, were, there are reports about temperature increase in the E region from IceCAD data, and in, in, the, in the E region, and significant temperature decrease in the F region. And this, uh, this decrease was seen simultaneously in, uh, by FPI and po POCA flat, and uh, it is quite substantial of the order of 100 Kelvin. Uh, so at high latitude, it seems like. Uh, mm, we, we, we do get some results, some significant variations in temperature. At the same time, there is ongoing debate on relative importance, what happens at low latitude. From one hand, uh, um, Leo at all pre uh, presented analysis of uh, Champ and Grace data and reported cooling during strat warming at low latitude, but um, simulations by Fuller Roll uh, said that maybe it is not really strat warming, maybe it's geomagnetic forcing. And this is just to indicate that how it takes a lot of work actually to understand and, and untangle where, where this type of, type of changes come from. So to summarize this slide, we have several slides that confirm warming in the uh, low, uh, at high latitude warming at 120 to 150 kilometers or cooling even at higher altitudes, but response at low latitudes is a matter of really large debate. Uh, also, re temperature response at low latitude is uh, still not understood. We need additional evidence. Uh, what was accepted uh, much faster is strong variations in ionospheric parameters, in ionospheric vertical drifts and, uh, and electron density. Left figure shows uh, variations in uh, plasma drifts at, uh, measured by Hikamaka radar. Black line shows average drift from over 30 years of measurements, and uh, color lines show variations what we see during strat warming. What we see is large increase in uh, large upward drift in the morning, followed by strong downward drift in the afternoon, and very clear uh, pattern with, uh, with a 12 wave pattern with maximum and minimum separated by about six hours. Uh, of course, what we expect is that upward drift will increase in equatorial ionization anomaly, and downward drift will suppress uh, equatorial ionization anomaly. And this is exactly what we see with um, TEC data. If uh, top, fi top figures, top plots are multi-day means before strat warming, the uh, bottom figures shows large increase in equatorial anomaly in the morning hours, followed by depletion uh, in the afternoon hours. So uh, what we see that it extends all the way up to mid latitudes, strongest low latitudes extends all the way up to mid latitudes. And entire daytime ionosphere is affected. Variations in TTC of the order of 50, 100, 150%. Largest what we saw is of the order of 200%. So we're talking really about enormous change in the ionosphere. Uh, important feature of this change that if we, uh, how actually it's easier to see it when we, uh, when we take multi-day mean for particular uh, for a particular longitude and look at it as function of local time and latitude and look at variations before strat warming. There is a little bit of variability, but no consistent pattern. Strat warming variation is clear semi signature. 
here it starts with increase in the morning, decrease in the afternoon. And what is important, how it progresses in time. In matter of several days, there is a shift, progressive shift to late, later local times. And this is also important to understand because this happens only in matter of four days. If you do not have enough resolution in the instrument, and if you have to average four or five days of data, you completely lose it. You cannot see the signature. So this is why really high resolution in data uh, extremely important to be able to pull out this type of phenomenon. Um, what causes this shift? What causes, uh, what causes this uh, uh, shift to later local times is again a matter of debate. And at this point, we start talking about different types. Uh, with one with source uh, variation, um, just temporal, temporal development variation, we assume this is semi-diurnal tide, but we also know that there are important things, important diurnal tides, diurnal, diurnal tides make, make large contributions. And uh, this slide shows how um, Lynn et al. used um, uh, cosmic data for January 2009, stratomen event, and actually separated different tides in uh, ionospheric signatures. They look at tides uh, before strat warming, during strat warming. They looked at uh, diurnal, semi-diurnal, diurnal tides, migrating, non-migrating. Uh, what they concluded that differences what we see if they take all migrating tides before strat warming, all non-migrating, all, all migrating tides during strat warming, and look at the difference. Uh, migrating changes in migrating tides explain all the signature, and if you look. If you compare this difference, you look at this difference uh, obtained from cosmic data and compare it to the difference what we see here with TC data. Increase in the morning, decrease in the afternoon, stronger negative signature in the southern hemisphere in the afternoon sector. This is exactly what uh, they showed with cosmic data. You understand this, was, this is very important, this is very encouraging for, uh, for the whole field that we have different groups of people using different instruments, they are, they are different analysis, different approaches, we have consistent results. This is what made all these studies uh, so, um, uh, uh, I would say, so, so, so inspiring, so interesting. Overall, we have strong consistency, and uh, one, uh, data from one analysis really confirms what we saw in some, in some previous you know, analysis. So that really gives us more, more confidence uh, about, uh, about this phenomenon. So uh, conclusion here was that uh, most changes are due to changes in the, in the migrating tides and non-migrating tides play only only minor role. My favorite slide about strat warming. Uh, my favorite slide, uh, one of my favorite example is uh, example from South America. You remember, well, stratospheric warming is a phenomenon in the polar stratosphere. When we look at digital zone data from, uh, uh, from Sao Paulo, uh, Sao Jose de Campos digital zone, 23 degrees south, green line average, multi-day average, black line variation during strat warming, we see increase in NMF2 uh, in the morning hours, decrease in the afternoon hours, decrease of the factor of four. And we see it day after day after day during strat warming. So to me, this is uh, one of the really interesting, one of the strong examples. Strat warming in the northern hemisphere, really strong feedback all the way in the southern hemisphere. How you, you, how you explain this? Um, so I, I try to present just sample of, sem several samples of results and um, immediate question what people ask after this presentation. Okay, if this is really true, if this is so strong, how come we really didn't see it before? People, people knew about strat warming for the last 60 years. Where have we been all this time? Why, why we have not seen it? Um, of course, first answer is that we have much better data availability, much better global models now. We had uh, all the studies came at the time of solar minimum when we can simply, see, it, it is much easier for us to separate uh, forcing from, uh, all this forcing from uh, during solar minimum, easier to understand. Uh, third part of the answer that, mm, to be completely honest, the way people long time ago who, uh, who proposed these connections, but uh, nobody was willing to listen to them and they really did not have enough proof. I again, going back to, to uh, answer one and answer two, we do have much better models, we do have much better, much better instruments right now. And my favorite, uh, 
And so, uh, to this, uh, uh, in, in addition to all, all three, uh, this is in, in another example what I, show, what I call selective attention effect. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. Okay, do we have sound? We do need sound. No. Okay. The correct answer is 16 passes. Who got 16? Did you spot the gorilla? <laughs> For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? <laughs> Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. <laughs> when you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. <laughs> and that's the monkey business illusion. Learn more about this illusion and the original gorilla experiment at theinvisiblegorilla.com. <laughs> So I, I really like, wanted to present this movie because um, you understand for several years I really felt like that gorilla on the basketball court. I would report results about straight woman. I would uh, talk in front of several hundred people. I'm thumping myself in chairs like that gorilla. And so look, look what happens. This is very strong phenomena. There are enormous ionospheric changes and people don't see it. <laughs> and. Uh, so important thing that our prior beliefs, our interests, our expectations really shape the way what we see. And in order to see these type of things, we really need to be prepared. And what we see is, what, what we really need to do is uh, just change our expectations. And change our expectations in our cases, we really need strong theory of connections, not just data, not just simulations. We really need, uh, have a need for a really good theory. Um, why, uh, why all this, why, why this phenomenon, why these anesthetic changes were really unexpected? Why, why it was gorilla on the basketball court? When we talk about planetary waves, high station, uh, uh, quasi stationary planetary waves that are excited in the uh, high latitude stratosphere, uh, we, know, we know that they simply do not propagate all the way to mesosphere lower thermosphere. Uh, their propagation conditions are guided by um, zonal mean flow. They, and at some point, they, uh, when they have, uh, they propagate in the, under eastward zonal mean, when, they, uh, when, 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 when circulation becomes westward, they simply cannot propagate to higher latitudes. And they also cannot propagate to, to the equator, to lower latitudes. So they are restricted. The area where we have this high, um, uh, high activity, uh, high magnetic planetary waves is really restricted to, uh, to this area in, in both latitude and, uh, and altitude. And, uh, but largest effects we see in the ionosphere close to the equator, in low latitude ionosphere. And we see, we, 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 explain, we think that this uh, is explained by tidal phenomena. If we could explain increase, large increases in tides, we could explain our ionospheric variations. But how, how do we tie all this? Uh, so we need to, to explain, we need to tie propagation both horizontally to the equator and both vertically. And as uh, waves don't propagate that high, end of story. This is why it was, it was extremely unexpected to have, uh, to, to have this type of connection. However, if we look uh, a little bit closer and go back to theory that was developed by middle atmospheric scientists back in 70s and 86, one of the effects of um, uh, planetary, quasi stationary planetary wave forcing that they drive global circulation cells. Uh, and these global circulation cells are um, clockwise in the, uh, at low latitudes up to about 40 kilometers and anticlockwise at higher altitudes. 
They extend all the way to the equator and to the southern hemisphere, and uh, they cause ad adiabatic heating in the stratosphere. This is why we highlighted stratosphere. This is why we have warming. They cause adiabatic cooling in the high latitude uh, mesosphere. This is why we have cooling. And they, they cause opposite, uh, opposite effects, cooling in the uh, tropical stratosphere and warming in the tropical mesosphere. So, and if you explain, so this was, uh, this was understood theoretically quite, quite a bit, quite, quite a while. And if you look at uh, this phenomena, if you just, just from this theory, you can see what kind of effects we can expect in the ionosphere. If, we, if, our, uh, if, if our zonal mean winds, if our, if our wind system really change, we can expect altered gravity wave transmission. So people who study gravity waves will certainly see during such events, certainly will see variations in gravity waves. We will have um, changed, uh, we will have large variations in planetary waves because planetary waves are also very, very uh, um, sensitive to, uh, 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 to, to wind propagation. We will have altered tide transmissions. We can have induced meridional circulation, maybe all the way in the ionosphere. And uh, this distribution, this circulation changes also can uh, bring el can, can alter tide generation. So there are many, many possible, uh, po possible things what we can expect just from the theory. Do we see them or not? Uh, and uh, now we proceed to some explanations. What are actually the suggested mechanisms? How we can explain the observed variations? One of the explanations, one of the mechanisms is interaction, nonlinear interaction of planetary wave with tide that is supposed to um, generate non-migrating semi-diurnal tide, which is shown over here. And, uh, and this analysis by Pedatello and Fold showed increase in both, both non-migrating tide and migrating tide. So this is a good explanation. We know that this mechanism will work, but it provides only partial explanation because there are a number, number of things even in this figure that uh, non interaction of planetary with tide simply doesn't explain. <coughs> in particular, temporal development of the, uh, of the events. Another suggested mechanism was, uh, in, another mechanism was suggested by Panchevay Mukhtarov. They uh, analyzed cosmic data and uh, they documented decrease in, uh, in uh, uh, electron, electron density at uh, low latitudes, low to mid latitudes. And they suggested that, um, remember the atmospheric cooling at high latitudes that we're talking about, they suggested that this atmospheric cooling causes disturbances in the wind dynamo and through it, uh, through it disturbances in the electric field dynamo. So it would be very similar to um, uh, variations, disturbed, uh, disturbed wind dynamo mechanism that we are familiar uh, from geomagnetic storms. High energy input, temperature increase in high, in high latitude. So it's very similar, uh, very similar mechanism after this, but uh, the source why temperature change is very different. In this case, temperature change, change comes from below. Uh, on top of this, okay, uh, on top of this, um, another suggested mechanism is uh, uh, enhancements in lunar tide. And this was suggested first by Fea et al. and received quite a significant attention after that that especially if we look at variation increase in the morning, decrease in the afternoon, in progressive shift, correlates really well with a phase shift due to progression of lunar tide. And uh, what we expect in this case, uh, lunar tides cannot be really uh, affected by, uh, 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 lunar tides can be affected by change propagation conditions, uh, zonal wind and temperature. Uh, Another, in, another topic what we, slide 29, I have 42. I, I will rush. <laughs> another mechanism which is really interesting for me, that if we look at this uh, dis di disturbances in the, uh, in the stratosphere, in the circulation, we looked at uh, disturbance goes both upward and in meridional direction. And if we, we remember that we have, um, we have our tides, migrating tides, uh, are um, generated by absorption of um, solar heat by ozone and by uh, water vapor. And if we have a transport of ozone from lower stratosphere to higher stratosphere, and also in the cooling region, we would expect some variation in ozone. And in fact, we see this variation during strat warming, and it reaches up to 25% of uh, ozone variation before strat warming. 
Again, it can be explained by superposition of several different phenomena, uh, upward transport, meridional transport, and longer ozone lifetime due to tropical cooling, which is another effect of stratospheric warming. What is implication of all this? That uh, implication that because of higher ozone, we'll have increase in the migrating semidiurnal tide. In addition to this, uh, we can also expect variations and uh, variations in non-migrating semidiurnal tide. Because if we compare distribution of ozone under conditions of low planetary reactivity and under conditions of high planetary reactivity as with threat warming, we see that distribution of ozone becomes strongly asymmetric. And strongly asymmetric distribution of the source will give us uh, will give us non-migrating tides. So this opens up uh, really big questions about um, existence of non-migrating tides of stratospheric, stratospheric origin, in addition to all the studies what we uh, accumulated up to date of non-migrating tides, what we already know, non-migrating tides because of water vapor. So the whole concept here is that we we have to look at planetary waves, not only in the purely mathematical point of view, in interaction of planetary wave with tide and, plus mi and uh, modes, generic modes plus minus, but that from physical point of view, planetary waves can in indirectly drive short-term variability through variations in the source region. And this is actually quite different from what we saw before. Um, I could mention a lot of developments in different models, simply do not have time, and to be honest, just, there's enormous development in models working extremely hard to understand this phenomena. There, there is a lot of progress in, with different simulations, including in uh, behavior of tide, including behavior in, uh, in electromagnetics, in electro, electrodynamics response. And we have very good steps. We can, uh, we can um, uh, models start seeing similar effects, but magnitudes are much, much smaller. So initial conclusions that we have solid experimental evidence. We have several uh, that such ionospheric disturbances occur. We have several mechanisms that have been suggested. We do not really know importance of these mechanisms. Do they work? Do they not work? And what, is their relative, what are their relative contributions? And we can expect that it will be very uh, complex because superposition of effects from different, different, different um, uh, mechanisms will cancel each other or enforce each other. Uh, often people ask, these are a couple of also important slides, people ask, stratomics happen only once in a while. Why do we really care? Why do we need to focus on them? Uh, because it, it is such a rare phenomenon. But uh, what we see with, uh, with these studies that um, if a black line shows stratomic event and large ozone change during strength warming, and it's generated by this, what we see with, uh, with these studies that um, if a black line shows stratomic event and large ozone change during strength warming, and it's generated by this, this particular planetary, planetary wave two, we see that similar phenomena happens during other, uh, other planetary wave enhancements that do not lead to strat warmings. So planetary activity throughout the winter, and we see these variations throughout the winter. If we look, uh, going beyond strat warmings and look in general at planetary activity, we have strong planetary reactivity in the northern hemisphere in winter time from November to March, but we have strong planetary reactivity in the southern hemisphere from May to November. So what we are talking about, if we are talking about variations in low latitude ionosphere, we will have them year round. If, if we have progress understanding what happens during strat warming, we can apply this knowledge to uh, pretty much year round. Um, Another question, what happens during high solar flux? What we saw so far is really solar minimum conditions. If solar flux increases, maybe we don't see any of this. Uh, honest answer would be that this remains to be seen, but our preliminary results show that we have quite strong variations even during high, higher solar flux. If in this case we saw increase up to 25 units during solar minimum, during solar maximum increase in TC up to 100 TC units. Uh, so far, more comprehensive studies were done with lunar tides, and yes, we can discern, discern these effects even, uh, even during high solar activity. Uh, what do you expect in the future? We know that upcoming solar maximum will be quite low, so effects of forcing from lower atmosphere will be quite visible. 
And I honestly will be sensitive to both geomagnetic forcing and solar forcing. So this is the situation we will have to deal for the next 10 years at least, and maybe even in the next solar cycle. So we will see these effects more, more than we saw them maybe in, in previous three solar cycles. Uh, I've shown this slide, slide before, and I will uh, describe only briefly, talking about predictability. At this point, stratospheric conditions can be predicted up to 10 days in advance. They work really well. Based on these predictions, we organized five campaigns with Inkatensky the readers. We were successful at every campaign. What we show with these studies is that quasi-stationary planetary waves generate stratwarmings, and in response, we have variations in equatorial drift and variations in, uh, in, in anospheric density. At the same time, we know that gradients in anospheric density related to irregularities. The idea here is that if, the, if we understand all the mechanics of this from predictable conditions of, uh, of stratosphere, we can come to predictions of ionospheric behavior. And we are not as far as some might think. Um, again, in this case, we can use stratomen as a proof of concept and apply it to other planetary waves. So message here that uh, focused studies of these events have potential of bringing truly, truly transformative change to anospheric research. Um, talking about truly, uh, tr truly transformative, am I uh, unreasonably optimistic? I have good reasons to be optimistic. optimistic. We have built really tremendous momentum in research of, uh, between lower upper atmosphere. Non -migrating, understanding of non-migrating tides, gravity waves is just one example. We have strong evidence of strat warmings, uh, ionospheric effects during strat warmings. We have rapidly developing modeling capabilities. We have uh, advances in, uh, really good advances in data simulation products like NASA Mira, NOGAPS Alpha, ECMWF. These are really powerful tools that uh, be became available for researchers. Uh, at this meeting, we'll talk about new missions. We have, as a CEDA community, we have really rapid development of our, our own capabilities with our instruments. So we have the means to address many questions. And uh, important part of my, why I am optimistic, I am optimistic about the CEDA community. Uh, low atmospheric community for a number of years goes through the process what they called raising the roof. They discovered it uh, uh, and actually appreciated it only within the last 10 years that if they increase top of their models, they can solve a lot of their problems. It took them 20 years. It took them actually more than 20 years. When we talk about our community, when we talk about importance of non-migrating tides, when we talk about importance of threat movements, non-migrating tides, the whole idea was accepted in less than 10 years. This is what, how, how our community reacted to it. Threat warming, we've presented first results for years. Now I'm talking in front of you. We're beginning to accept it. Turn around, only four years. In general, this is really created to the whole community, to, uh, to opportunities provided by, by this workshop. And uh, my main message over here, I have reasons to be optimistic, optimistic and I do think that we'll have, uh, we'll have a lot achieved in the next five years, and you will be the people who will be doing this. And many thanks to everyone who supported me, who uh, provided shoulder to cry, and who uh, initially said that I have no idea what you, are selling, what you are telling. I cannot do what you want. I have no resources. And some time later, those people came and said, you know, I cannot do what you ask, but I can, I, I can increase my experiment. I can add several more days. I can, turn, I can develop different modes. Would that help? I, can put, I, I cannot do what you want, I have model out, I have no resources to analyze, but you know what? I actually had graduate students, and I gave them the project. And there were many, many people like this, and it, to me it represents the whole, our whole community. And this is what makes me really optimistic. Thank you.